Hey everybody, Rob B here with Rob D, and you are listening to the Property Podcast. It's episode 277. I'll give you 279 for it. No, 274. This week, we are negotiating. Yes, welcome to the Property Podcast. I love episodes like this. It's always great when we get to hear from our listeners and have some other voices on the show. Today, you're going to learn a lot from some very switched on individuals. And make sure you stick around to the end because Robbie is going to be sharing some negotiating tactics of his own as well. This week on the Property Podcast, we've got two news stories for you. And while they are educational, they're also a warning. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago where you can have literally in the same publication two stories that conflict with each other and that's something we've seen recently in the guardian yeah one publication one week apart two different stories so 31st of may uk house prices fall in may as pressure grows on household budgets nationwide data shows 0.2 percent month-on-month decline oh dear well by the 7th of june a week later same publication house prices rise by 1.5 percent in may what a turnaround in just a week. Yeah, I thought we had busy weeks, Rob, but that is um, <laughs> that's some movement. Yeah, so I thought I'd do a little bit of digging into why this is the case, because we talked about scepticism when reading the press. And in fact, I've got a whole column about that in the next issue of the Property Hub magazine. So it's worth trying to figure out what's going on here. And I think I found the answer. The story about prices falling comes from the Nationwide Index, and the story about them going up comes from the Halifax Index. There are several others, but those are the main two that you'll typically see. So why are they coming up with different results? Well, I actually read through this whole thing from the Office of National Statistics about this, and I think I've come up with two reasons. One is that obviously they don't go and figure out the price of every house in the country. That's just impossible. So they use some sampling from their own data, then they'll do some fancy modelling to it and extrapolate it out to work out what's happening across the whole country. Now, obviously, the more data you've got, the more accurate that extrapolation is going to be. At the moment, there are not that many transactions taking place. Therefore, results are likely to be less accurate. And if you've got two people measuring very slightly different things with not much data, you're probably going to come out with different numbers. The second reason I think is more interesting. Nationwide lends all over the country, but it's got a bias to the south. It does more lending in the south than the north. Halifax, on the other hand, does more lending in the north than the south. We know that prices are growing in the north and flatlining in the south, so I think that could probably go a long way to explaining the difference. And even though they try to correct for all this in their algorithm, I reckon that could be having an effect. So, Rob, I think this is probably about the most crystal clear demonstration you'll ever see to contradictory stories a week apart in the same publication about why you've got to be very careful and really dig in a bit to find out what's actually going on. Absolutely, Rob. And that's why it's dangerous to just consume headlines, which so many of us do now through social media. You see a headline, you may not even read the article and you end up retweeting it. And I think as a society, more and more people do that. We read headlines and just start spouting them out as facts. Now, Rob's a wonderful ambassador for all the geeks out there. The the level of research and detail he's dug into just to get to the bottom of these news stories. But it just shows you that the main headlines there completely different a week apart and actually both slightly misleading in in different ways because actually the market's probably somewhere in the middle because if you rely on northern data the property market in this country is doing great if you rely on data in the south the market's really struggling but actually it's a combination of the two so it's not to say that every headline you read you need to spend half an hour researching it to see if it's correct or not but it's more to say don't just take the headline at face value and accept that it's a truth So if you're listening to this podcast on the day it comes out, it is the first first day of July, so it's meetup night. So we're wishing all hubbers who get out in the sunshine today to a meetup across the world, not just UK, across the world. So if you're a hubber going to attend one of the meetups tonight, have a great time. The numbers grow every single month. It's an incredible community, so friendly, so helpful. So if you're going along, have a fantastic time. And if you do miss tonight's meetups, you're listening to this late or you just can't make it tonight, they'll be back next month. And you can get your ticket for your local meetup at thepropertyhub.net forward slash meetups. Now, a few weeks ago on the podcast, back in episode 272, in fact, if you want to go and read us, and we were talking about what we were calling the most exciting opportunity in property right now. This is an opportunity for an apprentice to come in to work with Rob B and his team to help source developments for our investors working with multi-million pound deals with the country's biggest investors, getting exposure to what's going on in property at the very highest level. It really is a phenomenal opportunity. And we've had a phenomenal response. 
We put this out to podcast listeners because, well, we knew that we couldn't just have someone who's already within the industry because we don't like the way that the industry typically does things. And we also knew that listeners to this podcast are wonderful, intelligent, ambitious people. Got to say, though, even knowing that, we were surprised by the quality of applicant we got. We asked our candidates to tell us what the most impressive thing was that they've done in the last 12 months. Just have a listen to some of these. The trans Siberian Express. I went to some of the most remotest places in the world, whether that be Yetheringberg, which is on the European and Asian border, or Kursk, which has got the deepest lake in the world, or Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, where I stayed in a year with a Mongolian family. While studying my master's, I actually run a small events company called Resonate. Resonate hires big name international DJs from around the world to come and perform our latest events. One of our first events we sold around 120 tickets and our last event we sold 820 tickets and it was our biggest one yet. Do a thousand mile bike ride essentially and then come out unscathed and then dislocated my knee at my friend's wedding, dancing like an idiot. Really I suppose the the bike ride for me is the most impressive thing I've done. It was essentially charity bike ride 969 miles recycled from London to John O'Groats. The Limassol Half Marathon. I walked down the Limassol seafront and just saw just an abundance of plastic bags and plastic bottles and the ocean just completely ruined. Decided that I had to do something about it. So obviously living in Limassol was aware that the marathon was taking place the next Sunday. So I decided that I was going to raise as much money as I possibly could for the Plastic Oceans organisation. So without any training, ran a half marathon and raised just shy of 900 euros, which I thought was quite impressive. Wow, so some seriously impressive stuff there. But what we wanted to do from this process is bring you some extra value. So another question we asked our potential apprentices is to tell us about a time they negotiated a deal in the last 12 months. And we've selected some of the best negotiation tips from all of our candidates so you can share in their killer tactics. So first up, with her negotiation tactic, is Helen. I'm busy moving, relocating back to the UK from Prague in end of July. I have a preferred remove list who I've used before who were really great, but they were quite pricey. So I went and got three or four other quotes for same services. And then I went back to the guys and said, look, here's the gap. Um, can you do anything about it? Because I'd like to use you, I've used you before. And so we managed to negotiate and agree a discount, a sizable one. So that was great. Okay, I like this one. Because what Helen's doing is providing a reason. She's not just hearing the price and trying to knock something off that price just because she wants to pay less. She's gathered some data and that's effectively serving two purposes for her. It's showing them that she's got a reason for negotiating because their prices are out of line with everyone else. Maybe there's a good reason for that. That's for them to justify. But what she's also doing with that is showing that she's got other options. If they don't come down in price, she already knows that she can go elsewhere. So it's often said about negotiations that you can only win if you're willing to walk away. And in this case, Helen is demonstrating she clearly is. The other thing I like about what Helen's done here is she's not got too comfortable. So you do end up working with preferred suppliers or partners. And sometimes because you've got that cosy relationship, you've worked with each other a while, they might not be as sharp on their pricing. Now, this might not be because they're trying to do you over. It might just be that they're a bit lazy with their pricing and think, oh, you know what? Helen will accept that price. It seems fair. Let's put that quote in. So you always need to check and keep checking the quotes that you get in if you're working with a preferred supplier. Now, when you work with a supplier for a while, sometimes they can get a little lazy with their pricing. It's not because they're trying to do you over. It's just that they may not be as sharp as they once were because they've got a great relationship with you. That doesn't mean you have to accept mediocre pricing. And it also means you shouldn't assume that if you've got a great deal with a supplier first time round, they will always continue to give you a great deal. They may always continue to give you a fair price, but is it a great deal? So what Helen's done here is she's not made that assumption. She's gone out and checked the market, come back to them and told them, hey, you're a little bit toppy from where you need to be and still got to work with her preferred supplier. So I really like that from Helen. No complacency there. And she's got herself a better deal because of it. So next up, we've got Chris. And the great thing about Chris is he didn't switch off his negotiation skills while traveling. Oh no, he kept them razor sharp. When we were travelling, we ended up in Australia, and while we were in Australia, we needed to make a bit of cash to carry on. So I decided to start my own removal business, and to do this, I needed a ute, as they call it, 
uh, utilities vehicle to you and I, and I was hoping to spend about $4,000 on this. And I've seen one on Gumtree, which I really liked, for $4,500. So initially, I messaged the guy, and I was like, what is your final price that you'd accept? And he got back to me and he said $4,000, but without a roadworthy certificate, which is like an MOT over there, but a more um, rigorous one. So I went there knowing this, and I got there, the vehicle was fine, it ran well, and I decided to offer $4,000, but with the roadworthy certificate, which costs about $170 itself, that's if nothing's wrong with it. So a bit of two and a throw, and but he, in the end, accepted that deal. And a week later, I went with the $4,000 and got the car with the certificate. So both of us were happy. Well, Chris showed some tenacity here, which I really like. First thing he did was just go straight in and ask for a discount. A real case of don't ask, don't get. He effectively got the seller to negotiate against himself by just asking and dropping $500. But then he didn't stick there either. I guess he sensed blood in the water. and thought, well, if he's going to drop down like that, maybe there's a little bit more in it. And the nice thing is he didn't get carried away. He could have really screwed the guy down, but instead they just had a little bit of a negotiation. He got something that was worthwhile to him and it sounds like the seller went away happy as well. So Chris used some negotiating tactics to start his business. Then once the business was up and running, it didn't stop there. But on top of this, in the coming weeks doing my removal business, I realised I was negotiating with people on a daily basis for the jobs I was doing, whether that be before I turned up through pictures or what they told me about the job or when I got there and saw the job. And... All these negotiations, I used a, a method or a phrase which I coined, which was the triple F phrase, which is fair, friendly, and firm. So I went into negotiations with these three things. So I like them to be fair because I didn't want to con anybody out of money because you get a bad reputation then. They may leave a bad review. They may not tell the friends and they definitely won't come back to you if you don't make your offer fair. Also friendly. I don't see the need for you to not be friendly in the negotiation. You become friends with the person. You get their respect. You get them to like you. And they're more likely to accept the deal. And also firm. I believe you can be friendly and firm in a negotiation. So yeah, I'd be firm. I'd look at the job. I'd see a fair price. And I'd stick to that, give or take a few dollars. With those three characteristics, I found that all of my negotiations and deals were good for both parties, me and the person I was dealing with. I really like this from Chris, and I think he's summarised what's really key to negotiation is actually a lot of it is just the basic things, and he's got the FFF strategy, fair, friendly, and firm. I'm just glad it wasn't fair, friendly, and sharp. Ultimately, negotiating is just doing a lot of basic things right. It's not trying to come up with wacky tactics to try and get the best deal possible. Yes, if you've got an approach or an in that's a little bit different that you found works for you every time, then great. But actually, standing by a fair, friendly and firm approach consistently over time so people know the type of person they're going to deal with, your reputation will be built over time. I love this from Chris because it's just the basics, but the basics are so effective. Sometimes people get excited by the latest tactic or strategy in any field, but in negotiation especially, like do this offer first and then you get, then go back in with this. But actually, if you want to build a reputation and be a successful negotiator year after year after year, by sticking to Chris's principle, I think you'll do better than most. By being fair, by not trying to screw the other party over, by being friendly so they want to deal with you again and probably say, hey, you know what, this person's all right to deal with, and firm so they know they can't push you around or take advantage of you. I think that combination is super effective. And I've never heard it summarized that way before, but I really like it. Yep, just the basics done well can get you a long way. The next up, we're going to hear from a candidate who's also been doing some negotiating overseas. Here's Charlie. We have just decided that we'll be moving back to the UK from Cyprus after living here for quite a while. We've basically invested in an area of high capital growth without really knowing it about 15 years ago before it actually experienced the capital growth itself. We've decided now to try and sell the house, but as Cyprus estate agents have been known to be incredibly expensive and not that fair and charge 5% commission, which is obviously huge if this is your largest asset in the world. And I've basically managed to organize a meeting with a local estate agent who's just starting up 
and suggested that obviously we'd owned the house in that area for the longest and therefore we know all the people around us and all that kind of thing and that we'd be happy to spread the word about their reputation coming up and also mentioning that I also work for a property management and lettings company myself and would be happy to refer our clients to them if they could cut us a deal on our house and so they actually reduced the commission from 5% to 3%. Obviously 2% in the grand scheme of things of selling a house is a huge, huge number. Now what Charlie's done here, which is really smart, is paint a bigger picture to get a better deal than he would on just a one-off transaction. So he knows that in that line of business, finding clients is hard and sources of referrals are really valuable. He identified that and importantly, he raised it and he made it a point of the negotiation. It would have been a mistake if he just mentioned that he worked for a property management company himself and left the other person to join the dots. Sometimes you do have to spell it out. And by doing so, he got himself a good saving. It seems like they arrived at a price that still left the agent sufficiently motivated and compensated for doing a good job. He didn't make the mistake of saying, oh, you know, do this for free and then I'll give you this, that and the other. It's still a win-win, but he's also saved himself a significant amount of money. Next up is Matthew. As well as studying for his master's in real estate development, he also runs a successful events company. Negotiation stage is a very important part of Resonate. Uh, This determines whether an event will be financially viable and pretty much determines how much profit we'll make. So, of course, the more the fee means less the profit for us. Recently, DJ prices have been rocketing and there's been a high demand in DJs recently, which means the ball is in very much the core of the agencies who negotiate on their behalf. We have a range of discounts ranging between £1,000 to £7,000, which in some cases can be a 50% discount on their original asking price. If you take this significant cost reduction into consideration, when an event costs between five to twelve, it, five to twelve grand, it can really make a difference. And we've actually built a very trusting relationship with one of the best agencies in the industry. So I think our repeat custom has given us an edge in terms of bargaining power, which just goes to show how important it is to build long-term relationships with your client. So some strong negotiation from Matthew here, of course. The importance of building a relationship with your supplier is key. Being a good customer as well, you know, being easy to deal with, paying fast, etc. That all goes a long way to building up a reputation and being able to get yourself a deal. But it's also understanding the industry you're dealing in. Now, sometimes in an industry, you're almost expected to negotiate. Now, this may or may not be the case in Matthew's industry, but it sounds like it is a little bit. And another example of an industry where you're a bit mad to pay the full price is when you're paying for advertising space. So the rack rate, as it's often referred to, the list price that they'll put out there. If you're trying to negotiate some advertising space and and buy some, the person who's selling you that space almost expects a negotiation. And in fact, will probably throw a deal at you fairly early on. So just know the sector you're dealing in. Obviously in property, If we refer it back to that, if you're dealing with somebody in your local town who lives in their home and you're trying to buy their home from them, then they may not expect a negotiation. Doesn't mean you can't have one, but they may not expect it. However, a new build developer in London right now, in a market that isn't doing so well, would almost expect some sort of negotiation. So it's knowing your market, it's knowing who you're dealing with and their expectations. Don't always assume that a negotiation is expected, but also don't be embarrassed to think I can't negotiate when sometimes negotiation is very much part of the process. So these are some great stories that we've heard from our potential apprentices, and there's a lot to take away. So both parties can be winners. That's a theme that we saw throughout, and that's of course something we're happy to see because that's the way that we like to do business as well. Also, know what you're buying, know the market, know your value as a customer as well. And understand what repeat business is worth to the person you're negotiating against. Also, remember that negotiations aren't just about money. Is there something else that you can offer as well? And finally, don't be afraid to renegotiate if you need to. So from just a few stories, there's a lot that you can take away and use. But I couldn't let this episode end without getting some tips from our own master negotiator, Rob B. Because Rob, we've been spending a lot of time together recently, and I've been noticing how you approach negotiations. So we've already heard a lot of great tips from our candidates. But what would you add? What's always in your mind when you're going into a negotiation? First thing I'd say to most people in any negotiation is understand the landscape. So don't just think about two numbers and where you want to meet in the middle. Think about the bigger picture. 
So who is this person I'm dealing with or who is this company I'm dealing with? What do they want? What's their motivation? And what does a win look like to them? What will offend them? What will get them interested? And is there something different I can offer to make this deal move forward? Also appreciate the time scales involved. Some people may be desperate to do a deal. Some people may not be under as much pressure. You may be desperate to do a deal or you may not be under pressure as well. Understand your own circumstances where your strengths in the negotiation lie, but also be aware of your weaknesses as well. So take time before you go into any negotiation to assess everybody who's involved, their motivations. Another thing that may come to a shock to you, dear Hubba, is that you do not always need to negotiate. If you know the landscape well enough and you know the parties involved sometimes you can get to a deal a little bit quicker than you would normally a price that you're both happy with with nearly your first offer or your second offer because you know what's important to them they know what's important to you you've got that respectful relationship with each other that a good price can be nailed down first or second attempt so don't feel like oh my first offer was accepted if you planned for your first offer to be accepted then that's okay another tip that is useful is play the villain or use a villain. So sometimes, if a deal is nowhere near where you need it to be, I will instruct the team to use me as the villain. So they're negotiating with somebody and we can't get a deal that we want. And they can say, oh, listen, you know, I'm with you. I want this to happen. I want to book this thing or I want to purchase or I want to do this deal. But my boss, Rob B, he just won't move unless we get it to this level. You know, I'm really keen to make this happen. He's stubborn, he's not working with me. What can we do to get to closer to the price? Because I don't want to lose this. What's happening there is my team member is siding with the person they're negotiating with, or displaying empathy at least to their situation and how hard the negotiation is, and using me as a villain. Now, I've instructed the team to do that. I'm very happy to play that villain sometimes. And you don't have to have a team to do that as well. You can use your husband or your wife. I'm sure many of you would be quite comfortable using them as a villain to say, listen, I want to make this happen. But my husband, he's just not moving. Unless we get to this price, we can't do a deal. So the villain tactic I've found actually works quite well also. So there's a few extra tips for you. And of course, over the years, you're developing matures and, and you think differently around certain subjects like negotiation. But a while ago, over three years ago, in fact, we did a, a podcast on this very subject. Episode 127, we looked at negotiation. We gave you even more tips, tactics and philosophies you can use when approaching a negotiation. A final word on this subject, though. It's often said, but I think it's a lasting truth, that both parties should come away happy from a negotiation. If someone feels screwed over through the process, then it's not been a good negotiation. Not even for the one person who thinks at that moment in time they've got a better deal and they've done the other person over. Because that may come back to haunt you further down the line. Or that person certainly won't recommend you to do business with you again. So always look to get to a point where both people are happy. And that is achievable more often than you'd think. Now, we've seen in this episode already that we've got some very, very impressive listeners to the Property Podcast. None more impressive than those brave souls who brave the Apple Podcasts interface to leave us a review. And to thank them and show our appreciation, we'd like to read a review out every single week. We do. And thank you to this wonderful hubber, Green Base. Green says, I've been toying with the idea of going to property investment for a few years without having the confidence to take the leap. Having subscribed to the podcast less than a year ago, I'm glad to say I'm now looking for my fifth buy to let. Thank you, Rob and Rob, for sharing your extensive knowledge and giving people like myself the tools we need to hopefully become a successful property investor. It's refreshing to find free and informative advice without a sales pitch. And I must say, your ability to simplify many current topics and help me stay focused and well-informed. Great stuff, guys. Keep up the good work. Okay, thank you for joining us today. I hope armed with that knowledge, you'll be straight off to drive some hard but fair bargains. So you go do that and we'll be back on Tuesday with Ask Rob and Rob. And in the meantime, if you'd like to know what we get up to beyond the podcast, book yourself in for our next discovery webinar. You can do that at thepropertyhub.net slash discover. We'll see you in a few days time, but for now, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.